Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, the committee will be hearing testimony on two bills, proposing through number 136A, sponsored by Council Member Lender, and uh, into number 799, sponsored by Council Member Williams. Both bills aim to strengthen and expand the protections for workers under the city's human rights law. Currently, businesses of four or more employees are required to comply with human rights laws that prohibit discrimination and retaliation in the workplace. However, the law is unclear on whether volunteers, independent contractors, and other employee arrangements are considered employees for the purpose of this provision. In September 2014, the Law Enforcement Bureau of the City of New York, or if you are, of the New York City Commission on Human Rights, filed complaint against uh, the friends of a restaurant manager who had agreed uh, to place an advertisement for multiple wit and bar staff on the website. The friend places the advertisement as a favor to the restaurant manager. The ad stated that the restaurant looked to hire two Eastern European, Europe, European waitresses. While the, it appeared to violate the city's human rights laws, the commission was unable to establish the four employees requirement of the restaurants, given that the staff were hired after the discrimination took place and the relationship between the friend and the restaurant manager was that of an unpaid volunteer. To mitigate against future, future similar cases and lend more predictability to the four employee requirement, proposed intro 136A expands the definition of, of employer by adding the time frame of six months before the start of an alleged unlawful discriminatory practice and continuing through and including six months after the end of such alleged unlawful discriminatory practice. Independent contractors would also count toward the four employees requirement even if they are employers themselves. Proposing to 136A would also explain that person who volunteered, paid or unpaid, and any employees, parents, spouses, domestic partners, or child, if employed by the employer, all qualify as employees for the purpose of the four employee requirement. Similarly, existing and prospective directors, officers, members, and partners of the business organization may also be liable for certain discriminatory acts that they commit. Finally, franchisors and parent entities may be liable for certain unlawful discriminatory acts carried out by the franch franchises or subsidiaries companies. The second bill, N2799, also extends workers' protection and offers clarification. This bill would affirm that employees are indeed protected from re retaliation when they request a reasonable accommodation. Currently, the New York City human rights law prohibits retaliation by employers against an employee when they partake in a protected activity such as opposing an unlawful discriminatory practice, filing a complaint with the commission or court, or helping the commission or corporation council investigate a complaint. Unfortunately, recent ruling by the appellate division of the New York Supreme Court have excluded requests for reasonable accommodation from the list of protected activities. The Council wishes to ensure that individuals who request reasonable accommodation will not face retaliation by their employers, landlords, or other covered entities. 
We look forward today to hearing from the Commission of Human Rights, advocates, and stakeholders to learn more about uh, the recommendation regarding proposed into 136A and 1799. Before it begins, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the committee who have joined us today. We have Councilmember Consul Jerome, thank you very much, Councilmember, uh, who is also the chairman of the chair of the finance uh, uh, and the city council. He did a wonderful job this, uh, this year. I'd like also uh, to thank uh, the, the committee staff, uh, Balki Mireg, counsel to the committee, Lee Skripiak, policy analyst, and Isha Wright, unit head of finance division, as well as my staff, David Suarez, Walden Johnville, and Adam Willian. Now, uh, let me ask the council to administer the vote. Please raise your right hand for the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me take the opportunity also to thank uh, the uh, representative from the Commission of Human Rights. Thank you so very much and give my regard to the commissioner and to each one and all of you here. Thank you so very much for being here. But it's so very important, very important hearing because we know in New York City, human rights, civil rights, there are two very important issues. And we in New York City, we are in the forefront of the fight you know, for the respect of human rights of uh, people, regardless of who we could be, what the person, you know, were born or raised, regardless of affiliation, you know, of belief or religion. I think as human beings, we have to do that together as a society. We have to create a society where everybody can feel comfortable to live and raise their children. To each one of you, thank you so very much for being here. Thank you. So now, please, uh, you may start any time. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Eugene and uh, Council Member Drum and Committee Council. Um, my name is Damien Stadola. I am the General Counsel at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. I'm joined by Policy Counsel Zoe Chenitz. On behalf of the Commission, we thank you for convening this afternoon's hearing and are grateful for the opportunity to speak today in support of intros 799 and 136-A. Under the leadership of Commissioner and Chair Carmela Malales, the New York City H Commission on Human Rights works to enforce the city human rights law, one of the most protective anti-discrimination laws in the country. During her tenure, the Commission has consistently championed legislation, like the two bills being considered today, and other mechanisms that afford the law's protections to more New Yorkers, clarify the agency's expansive interpretation of the law, consistent with its construction <coughs> provision, and Restoration Acts and generally further the goals of combating discrimination and harassment in key areas of city living. The two bills being considered today expand protections for people who seek reasonable accommodations by protecting them from retaliation by employers, housing providers, and providers of public accommodations uh, and clarify the broad reach of employment protections to independent contractors. These bills touch on important areas of the Commission's work. Under the city human rights law, individuals are entitled to reasonable accommodations and employment based on their religious beliefs, disability, childbirth or related medical condition, and status as a, as a victim of domestic violence, sex offenses, or stalking. Individuals with disabilities are also entitled to reasonable accommodations in housing and public accommodations. These rights foster inclusion and help make our workplaces, our homes, and our public spaces open accessible and productive environments for all New Yorkers. Beyond accommodations, employment discrimination as a whole constitutes a significant portion of the Commission's work, representing approximately 51% of all complaints filed at the Commission in calendar year 2017. With recent amendments to the city human rights law regarding sexual harassment, the Commission is poised to address an even broader range of workplace discrimination. The bills that we are discussing today will further ensure that New York City, home to the largest economy in the country, continues to lead the way in protecting the rights of workers. The Commission believes that Intro 799 closes a clear loophole 
in the New York City human rights law and fully supports its introduction. The commission strongly supports 799, which would make it an unlawful discriminatory practice to retaliate against a person for requesting a reasonable accommodation based on religious beliefs, disability, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical condition, and status as a victim of domestic violence, sex offenses, or stalking. State courts interpreting the city human rights laws existing retaliation provisions have held that a request for reasonable accommodation is not a protected activity which can give rise to a retaliation claim. As a result, an individual who requests and receives an accommodation but is also targeted for negative treatment because of that request, uh, for example, by being assigned less desirable work uh, or negative treatment because of the request, losing special privileges from their housing provider, may be unable to establish a retaliation claim under the current uh, text of the city human rights law. This omission and coverage makes the city human rights law less protective uh, in this respect than federal law. And indeed, the daylight between the city human rights law and federal law on this is oddly out of place given the city law's history, its policy, and liberal rule of construction provided under the Restoration Acts. By making clear that res requesting reasonable accommodations is a protected activity, Intro 799 will allow people to come forward and communicate with their employers, their landlords, and other covered entities about their needs with the knowledge and confidence that they cannot be punished merely for asking. For this reason, the Commission fully supports Intro 799. Intro 136A would clarify and identify the list of workers who are protected under the city human rights law. The Commission already interprets the city human rights law to cover independent contractors and all interns. Such coverage is broader than federal law, which often excludes these workers from coverage, and broader than state law, which covers interns but not independent contractors. However, during a public hearing that the Commission held on sexual harassment in the workplace in December 2017, the Commission heard from many individuals, many New Yorkers, who are unaware of existing protections for independent contractors under the city human rights law. Therefore, this amendment would provide additional clarity around these protections which is particularly necessary given the changing nature of employment in New York City, including alternative work arrangements and increased outsourcing. In this regard, the Commission expresses its gratitude to Council Member Lander for his September 2016 report raising the floor for workers in the gig economy, which underscored some of the challenges that freelancers and independent contractors face and raised awareness about the ever-changing nature of New York's workforce and the need for the law to evolve in order to protect these workers. The Commission looks forward to working with the Council to further refine the language of Intro 136-A to define the relevant time period for assessing whether an employer meets the jurisdictional requirements to fall within the coverage of the city human rights law and to provide clear protections for independent contractors and other categories of worker who are often vulnerable to discrimination and harassment yet excluded from coverage under civil and human rights laws. The Commission supports an approach that does not rely on the categorical rejection of workers based on their job title or on a corporate form of their employer, and instead aims to meaningfully address discrimination as it is experienced and expand accountability for discriminatory acts to those entities and individuals with the power and resources to effect change. The spirit of these changes reflects this philosophical shift which we support the proposed amendments raise potential legal questions that the Commission will need to research further, and we look forward to the opportunity to provide feedback once we have completed that review. Overall, I wish to reinforce the Commission's support for legislation that provides greater protection against discriminatory acts in all spaces throughout the City, and our appreciation for City Council's ongoing attention to and efforts to strengthen employment protections. The Commission thanks uh, Chair Eugene and the members of the Committee for calling this hearing. We look forward to working with the Council on these bills. We thank you each for your partnership in strengthening and advocating for human rights in the city. I look forward to any questions that the committee members have. Thank you very much. Do you have any statement also? Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Uh, Stodala. That's correct. Is that correct? Yes. Oh. I make progress. <laughs> Thank you so very much. Uh, as we all know that uh, uh, harassment and discrimination and also protection, especially protection of human rights, you know, those are topics that are very important to all of us. 
and we have the moral obligation to do everything that we can do, as I said previously, to protect everyone. But at the same time, you know, so, uh, we have another obligation. Let me, uh, to make my point, let me read from your statement. Uh, <coughs> you say that uh, somewhere, however, during a public hearing that the commissioner held on sexual harassment in the workplace in December 2017, the commission heard from many individuals who were unaware of existing protection for independent contractors under the city human rights law. So that means, uh, what I want to say is that it is good for us to take decision to protect the right of the people, and we all should do that. We have to do, it, do that together as a society, as New Yorkers, as a city. But my question is, what the commission will do Number one, to inform the people about those, this type of protection, the extended protection and the enforcement of the protection, and also to make the employers know also the existence of those, those protection. Because I believe that there are two sides. The victim should know the right, what they have to do, and when they are discriminated, but we have to be pro proactive and so preventive. People should know exactly this is not acceptable. This is, you know, this type of uh, behavior or attitude is against the human right or, you know, our civil right in New York City. So what uh, the commission will do to inform, to educate both sides? Th thank you for your uh, question, Chair Eugene. Mm -hmm. um, in connection with the hearing we had at the end of 2016, um, the commission has been very proactive in addressing this issue, in part by the public campaign, sexual harassment campaign that our communications and marketing unit uh, deployed in the city, um, which was widely seen, reviewed, and called attention to this issue to, to all New Yorkers. And following that, also I referred to the commission's uh, robust report released on April 25th, 2018, um, that addressed what we learned from that hearing in order to uh, better inform both employers and the public that the commission does currently consider independent contractors covered by the law. Um, in those two respects, uh, trying to reach the public uh, directly <coughs> in a very um, prominent ad campaign and also by reiterating our understanding of how we enforce the law in the report, which also had a significant section devoted to employers about how to address that issue. Um, we've already undertaken significant action in that area and obviously we'll continue to do so. Thank you very much. Uh, based on what you said, that you have been proactive and uh, preventive also. But uh, if uh, the law, these two laws pass and uh, uh, voted, what the commission will do differently from what uh, you know, the commission has been doing before to ensure that you know, those law laws are, are, are known by the victim, the people who could probably be, you know, become victim, and also the people who probably would have, you know, uh, uh, un unacceptable behavior to violate those laws. What the commission will do differently to inform, to edu educate everybody, to make sure that we can get the, the best results that we are looking for. Well, I, I think this, uh, the commission under this administration, under the leadership of um, Chairperson Malalas, has uh, taken the public training and public information role very seriously. And, and again, uh, by pointing to the various media campaigns, ag aggressive media campaigns that we have engaged in over that time to inform all New Yorkers of their obligations, that is an ongoing um, role that the commission is mandated by statute to do and that we continue to do. In addition, um, the rec uh, recent trainings on sexual harassment is again and something else that the commission is addressing um, and working on trainings specifically targeted on sexual harassment. Um, and again, in making sure that we inform the public of their rights to come forward to the commission. Thank you very much. We have been joined also by Council Member uh, Lender, who is the sponsor of Intro 136A, 
uh, I want to give him the opportunity to uh, present his statement. Would you please, Council Member? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, convening and chairing this uh, important hearing. I really appreciate your, your doing it. Um, uh, and thanks to all the advocates uh, who are here and to the Commission, which has been such a great partner in working together to strengthen the human rights law. Um, and I'm sorry to be late, but I just uh, was glanced through your testimony, and I uh, appreciate the work that we've done together uh, to strengthen and expand the law. Um, and I appreciate your support of most of the elements of 136A, in particular expanding protections to cover uh, freelancers and independent workers. I want to shout out the Freelancers Union and a lot of other folks from the, um, who have been fighting discrimination who are in the audience today. I appreciate that you have looked to use your power expansively to prevent discrimination where we would not want it to be, uh, but also your support for this clarification to make clear that you know, as more and more people are uh, employed at work as independent contractors and freelancers, we have to make sure that they have the full protection of, uh, of our human rights law uh, against employment discrimination and in other ways as well. Um, and this law also takes some other interesting steps forward to help strengthen and expand the, the human rights law protections. Um, it would apply more of its provision to franchisers, you know, so for example, we recently saw Starbucks step up in, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia and recognize that there's a corporate responsibility for the actions of, uh, of, of their folks. Um, if that had been in a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, would there have been the same level? So our goal of making sure that franchises provide to their franchisees some of the same kind of public education and information and make sure that people are following the human rights law, some other issues that are in the law as well. So um, I think this is a great step forward for New York City, especially in protecting our independent workers and freelancers, but also in continuing to make sure we have the strongest human rights law in the country and are doing everything we can to, prevent, to protect New Yorkers uh, from discrimination based on who they are. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for that opportunity. I'll ask a few questions when you're, when you're done. Thank you very much, Council Member Lender. Thank you. Uh, um, Mr. Stodola, right? Uh, could you tell us what some of the problems the Commission have, has identified with the current for employee provision? That's mean, can you estimate how many complaints the Commission were not able to follow up on because of the definition of employer under the current human rights law. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, Eugene. Um, so we, at the outset, when someone walks into the commission with a complaint, uh, we don't keep statistics on their job titles in part because we investigate the facts as they lead us to potential coverage under, under the city human rights law. We take a broad interpretation to that law and therefore at the outset do not have statistics that segregate out, for example, in the employment, um, on the employment docket, which is a large part of our docket, who is coming in as an independent contractor or otherwise. However, we're not turning people away based merely on job title, which I think reflects the testimony that we've provided today that a categorical rejection of coverage based on job title or corporate form uh, is something um, that we would not want to see. That, uh, so I can't give you uh, specific statistics. What I can say is based on the process that we would uh, take a complaint, investigate the facts in order to uh, see where that investigation takes us. And that is the reason why we don't have full statistics on these issues. Second of all, they don't always bubble up in these cases in that way. Not every single case involving an independent contractor necessarily presents a contested issue about whether that person is an independent contractor. Second uh, and third, given that we recognize, again, in part thanks to Councilmember Lander's report on the gig economy from 2016, um, is that this area does concern some of the city's most vulnerable workers. So um, we take a very broad approach and want to ensure that we investigate the facts that may lead us to provide coverage under the city human rights law. I think the purpose of the two laws is to improve the work of the commission, to ensure that the commission, you know, uh, 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 do a better job in terms of protecting the right of the people. And, uh, but could you tell us uh, how those two bills will improve the work of the commission? Well, I think, in the first instance, I think we're looking forward to sort of, again, working with council about the exact language, particularly about the look back period, particularly about the language proposed um, for the additional subparagraph G and, and uh, subsection 2223. Uh, uh, um, but 
the uh, commission, again, always takes a broad interpretation to the claims that come before it, um, has always considered independent contractors uh, to be covered, and we take those claims and we'll investigate them and try to find out through that investigation process how the working relationship is actually operating in fact. Uh, we believe that one of the obstacles to protect the right of workers, the right of people who have been victimized or, or uh, 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 you know, facing a uh, discrimination situation is uh, retaliation. They're afraid. They don't want to speak up. You know, uh, they don't want to to raise the issue because they don't want to uh, to, to 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 face other complicated situations, losing their job or whatever. Uh, but uh, can you tell us how many uh, complaints in terms of you know? Uh, related to retaliation, how many complaints that you received during the past two years? Uh, I Can more. Th I don't have that number at the top off the top of my head. I'm more than happy to provide that number uh, to make sure that I give you an accurate number for what that is. Um, in connection with the bill's proposal to add retaliation uh, based on just making a request for reasonable accommodation, we do feel that that uh, support we support that change. Again, it closes a loophole that. Uh, removes the daylight between the federal standard and the city human rights law standard. We don't, uh, again, from a process perspective, uh, someone coming to the commission, we wouldn't have kept statistics uh, on turning someone away because we would have looked again at the facts of that particular case in order to see whether or not, under the current language of the law, we would be able to enforce that action. So I don't have c current statistics for you, but I will make sure to get that back to you very promptly. Well, thank you very much. I would appreciate it if you, send, if you can send you know, this information to the committee. Uh, could you tell us also what are the barriers of the commission to follow up, you know, uh, uh, in terms of uh, complaint related to retaliation? Any barriers that you believe that the, the, the commission has been facing that prevent the commission to move on, to investigate, or to, to fulfill the, 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 the goal of protecting the people's rights? Well, we... we I think as any government agency would say, I mean, there's always uh, uh, resources. We try to do the best we can with the resources we've got and address everything we can. If with unlimited resources, uh, um, that, that would be great um, uh, addition. But uh, again, from the perspective of our law enforcement function, when complainants come in the door to the commission, um, we, we have not uh, turned away based, again, on, on labels or, or uh, we try to investigate the facts that's been alleged again because we're an investigative agency and have that ability to sort of look exactly at the precise details of every case before we reach uh, a conclusion. Okay, but uh, you mentioned uh, resources. Of course, uh, any agency, you know, may face uh, uh, issues or challenges in terms of you know having enough resources to do the job. But in, in addition to the resources, I'm talking about you know uh, with respect to the. The, the definition of certain, uh, let's say, for example, employers, employees who who are covered by the definition, who are not covered by the definition. Did you give, did the commission face, you know, or, or barriers in terms of, you know, uh, the interpretation or definition or meaning of employers and employees before, you know, this legislation? Well, as I as I mentioned before, uh, Chair Eugene, I think you know in. In when the commission is faced with uh, employees that come with us with a claim, we take a very broad interpretation of the law, again, recognizing that the city human rights law is the most expansive and, and protective law of its kind in the country. So when we are faced with a complaint that comes in the door, we like to investigate um, the facts of each case. We do not reject people merely based on, on job title or the, or the corporate form, and we take those cases and investigate them uh, where the facts lead us. Um, we support the language proposed in 799, uh, again, because it clearly closes a loophole to the extent that that addresses a specific interpretation by a number of New York State courts um, as to the viability of uh, a potential claim uh, for denial of reasonable accommodation and whether that uh, making the, the, sorry, in connection with the making of a reasonable accommodation and whether that constitutes protected activity. We welcome and support that clarification. Clarification is something that the commission generally supports. Um, and in connection with uh, 136A, uh, again, we look forward to having um, uh, conversations to, to further clarify the, the best language 
in order to achieve the stated mission and goals of the City Human Rights Act. Uh, we are joined by Councilmember Williams, who is the sponsor of N2799. Uh, I want to call him for his uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you to the Commission for being here. Um, my bill, Intro 799, uh, amends the human rights law to prohibit retaliation against individuals who request a reasonable accommodation in the city's current human rights law. Uh, grounds for requests, some but not all, religious observance, pregnancy, childbirth, status of survivor of domestic violence, and medical condition. While the HRL protects against retaliation for filing a discrimination complaint opposing discriminatory behavior and other actions, there is no explicit protection uh, against retaliation for requesting an accommodation under the law. Recent court rulings interpret the HRL narrowly dismissing retaliation claims because request for, because quote, request for reasonable accommodations was not included in the HR retaliation prohibitions. Despite our instruction that the HRL be interpreted liberally, uh, we're here to uh, try and fix that. I was actually disturbed to hear that that uh, request is not protected because it seems to make sense to go along with other protected statuses. Um, I myself have a Tourette syndrome and ADHD. I uh, had to have some um, accommodations in high school and uh, college. I uh, would have uh, been kind of tough. Uh, if uh, I'm discriminated against because of that. So uh, I'm very honored to uh, have this bill and close this loophole. Um, this is kind of when the government is at its best, uh, trying our best to repair cracks where the vulnerable population will fall through. Uh, I've read over some of the testimonies, so I appreciate the support of this bill and hopefully the support of this committee. Uh, let's help some people out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Councilmember William. Let me go back to one of the questions that I asked you before. You say that you don't have the record of the, the number of complaints that the commissioner received, or you don't have them with you? You don't keep them on record, or you I, don't have? I don't have the number of exact complaints that we've received, for, for example, for calendar 27 off the top of my head, but I'm more than happy to provide that number. But, um, but you can find the documentation. Yes. You have the track record for of For general that, right? complaints, yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Linda, please. Great, thank you very much. Um, so thank you for your testimony, and and I um, I appreciate your broad support. Uh, I'm just curious, you you ref the reflect this question about potential legal questions, and I mean I agree we've got to get this right and do it in a thoughtful way. So I'm certainly open to doing that. I just wonder if you might say a little more about what you think the issues are that are presented that we need to drill down on together? Well, I, th I think it's an expansive question as part of the problem. I think in light of the time to consider the language, part of the, um, the fact that we've got other jurisdictions, other courts sort of interpreting language, um, need to take all of that into account to make sure that we have language that you know, is, is the most effective to achieve the stated goal um, of, of the human rights law. Um, in addition, you know, we're also interested in hearing what constituents, advocates, uh, workers uh, experience in order to make sure that we tailor, um, tailor the language to the best possible uh, way to achieve, uh, achieve the, the mission and, and intent of the, of the human rights law. And is that in particular on this question of how we're thinking about defining anyone who performs work for an employer or more about this? Because this, you know, the 136A does a few different things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some of this comes in part from the very particular way this council last term looked to cover interns, which was very specific. Uh, and I think at that time, you know, one of the bits of feedback from the commission was we want to be careful that we don't look by defining very specific categories to be excluding others. So we tried to take this broader approach of anybody who performs work for an employer, regardless of, you know, uh, so, you know, I, that is different from obviously the way that state employment law or federal labor law consider who's eligible, but I think we all agree we have the power to cover people in that broader way and that for the protections from discrimination, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an Uber driver, it doesn't matter if you're an intern or a volunteer, you should not be discriminated against if you're a member of a protected category. So anyway, we're, we're open to other feedback. We also obviously looked in this case in the law to expand who some of the responsibility for discrimination could attach to a broader set of people affiliated with an employer organization as well. So um, are there, and if you're not ready to say that's okay, we can follow up with you afterwards. I'm glad that you uh, support the spirit, but I'm, as we you know, both listen and drill down, 
Is it on one side or the other of those you think there are more issues, or how should we? I, I wouldn't want to qualify whether there's more issues or not on one side or another. Obviously, um, it, it, the, the goal of providing the broadest protection possible in light of the economic realities um, that workers in New York face is, is important. Getting the language right is, is part of the, uh, the issue, and we look forward to working with the council on that, both in terms of the, the expanding the rights and responsibilities, and also, as we said in our testimony, to ensure that those with the ability to make those changes are the ones charged with those kind of obligations. In addition to also working with the language on the look back period to ensure that that too um, reflects uh, the best uh, possible solution to addressing that, that issue. Okay. Um, one thing I think we're looking at in relationship to independent contractors, you know, on, on first thought we're thinking about protecting independent contractors uh, from discrimination. Then there's the issue that in some cases independent contractors are themselves acting as supervisors on behalf of the company that's employing them, and they need to be, you know, um, given clarity by that employer of their responsibilities to protect the human rights of people for whom they might be in a supervisory role. Um, and I'll just flag that as something where I think we need to do some work together to make sure that we've get, we get that right. Um, and then you didn't respond, your testimony speaks to the protections for um, independent contractors, which I think is, was, is great. It doesn't speak to this question of franchisers, and I, I wonder if you have any particular thoughts on that. Again, that, um, the idea here being that we want corporations to have some responsibility for making sure that the provisions of the human rights law are honored in their workplaces. and so. In, as the law currently exists, even where, where a supervisor or a store manager or someone engages in a discriminatory act, their business can be held liable and their business can make an affirmative defense that we have a set of policies in place that make sure that all employees know their rights and responsibilities under the human rights law. And this was an individual aberration and not a corporate, an act of essentially corporate discrimination or, or willful blindness to discrimination. So that's already all in the law. Uh, but as I said before, would can, you know that covers a corporate employer you know like Starbucks, but not a franchise employer like Dunkin' Donuts. And the idea here was to give the franchiser just like they're able to say exactly how thick the Big Mac is or you know exactly what color the chocolate donuts are. Um, we expect you to cover follow the New York City human rights law, and we have some responsibilities um, if you don't. But obviously, the franchise relationship is is different from the straight corporate employer relationship. So. Um, do you have a position on that yet? So we're, we, we would still like to be able to examine that in more depth. I think the um, commission echoes, uh, Council Member Lander, your, your concern about how labels are not helpful. Uh, so reject a, 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 a framework that would reject coverage b purely based on job title or corporate form is, is again, sort of an approach that we, we believe in, in, in principle works well. And I think giving up the language is is, is important to make sure that we get that get that done right. The commission has takes its uh, the, the breadth of the city human rights law very seriously and has done so and enforced um, uh, those provisions broadly to cover independent contractors, um, even when that explicit coverage is not necessarily written out in black and white. The commission obviously supports efforts to clarify where possible uh, the language of, of coverage so that everyone understands both what their rights are and that the res potential respondents understand what their obligations are. Okay, going just a little further on this question of um, what uh, <laughs> employers, if this bill passes, franchisors, board of directors can do, um, do you currently provide some guidance for how an employer can put themselves in the best position um, to exercise the affirmative defenses that the law provides in terms of what kinds of training, you know, the way the law uh, reads now, um, you know, if you're accused as uh, an employer more broadly uh, for uh, an act of discrimination, discriminatory harassment by an employee, you can put forward evidence that says, look at all the things that we do to make sure that we have the most, um, uh, the, a, a company that respects the human rights law as, as, as strongly as possible. Do you give guidance to employers on what that looks like so they will be best able to both, first and foremost, make sure that their businesses are places where the human rights law is respected, but I guess second, uh, defend themselves in those, in those cases? Well, as an initial matter, I think the commission is very interested in ensuring that we broadcast to the public and all employers not to discriminate. 
um, and that we are trying to hold trainings in public areas to explain what uh, the protections are under the law, not necessarily as uh, guidance to how to avoid its protections. Uh, I'm, so I'm not aware of any uh, Well, the goal of, of encouraging people to have good corporate culture and good corporate policy and provide trainings and provide a pathway to complaint and to make sure you will be heard, like, is to prevent, you know, is to get compliance with the law, not to provide people with a safe harbor, obviously. Um, uh, on the other hand, if the reason that those employers work hard to approve their corporate cultures and policies is because our law provides consequence if they don't and, uh, and some safe harbor if they do, um, so be it. Uh, but we don't currently, you don't currently have a, um, cause you know, and well, obviously when this council passed the sexual harassment legislation recently, we looked to specifically say, here's what we want employers to do. Um, but beyond that, you guys don't currently have a practice of providing some kind of um, guidance to employers on how they should proceed in that. In, in terms regard. of safe harbor, I'm not aware of that of that guidance existing. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Lender. Uh, we know that uh, there is nothing perfect in life. We don't have nothing perfect. We cannot pretend that anything that we're doing is perfect. And that's the reason why every single day we make changes. We try to improve what we are doing. And uh, uh, because uh, every time we, there's something that we didn't see, we didn't you know, imagine that should be corrected. But do you anticipate any issues with this law, those two laws? On 799, I think we've said that the closing of the loophole is a good uh, change, we support that. On 136A, I think as, as I've mentioned before, um, we want to make sure that we have further discussion to be able to get the exact language for the proposed changes right in order to achieve the stated goals. But that the spirit of the changes is, is something that the commission um, supports because it broadens, again, protections uh, to make clear that New, York, New Yorkers in um, uh, non-traditional employment relationships, like those who are in, in independent contractors and don't fit neatly, at least into the traditional way um, precedent has been applied, are, are indeed covered. And we've made um, we've made it clear, particularly in the uh, through the in the context of the hearing we held at the end of last year, um, that independent contractors are covered, um, and that we take cases when they come in and make sure that we investigate the facts and details of the working relationship to see where that goes to ensure the broadest protections available to, um, to New Yorkers. Thank you very much. Before I ask you my next question, which would be, I believe, the last one also, unless uh, I change my mind, <laughs> because I say nothing is perfect, I may change my mind. <laughs> so uh, let me acknowledge that we have been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you, Councilmember, for being here. Thank you. Uh, we all know that New York City is home to so many immigrant people, people coming from everywhere. And when people come to New York City, they come with the uh, tradition, the culture. And among the cultures and traditions, especially some immigrant, for people who came from the part of the world where, where I came from, they're afraid of uh, government. They're afraid to speak. And also there's another challenge or barrier for immigrants is languages, the language. There are many immigrant people, they, they, they don't speak. English is not the first language for them. No, that uh, creates another barrier for them. That means it's very difficult for them, number one, to navigate through the system and to make their living, to try to provide for the family. This alone is a big challenge. So in addition to that, there are so many laws, so many principles, so many things in New York City. My question to you, are you going to reach out to those people, the immigrant people, the people who are facing language barrier, cultural barrier, tradition barrier, to make them, a, them aware of those legislation, of those protection? What is your plan to reach out to those people and to help them also? be protected by, by those laws. And, and can yeah. I just add to this yes. question a little, Mr. Chair, because I do think when people hear the word freelancers, they sometimes imagine a certain set of independent contractors 
uh, who are less likely to be immigrants and people of color, um, but a very large, you know, the independent contractor category is a very large category, and it definitely includes writers and editors and graphic designers, and it includes uh, for hire vehicle drivers and folks sometimes doing home repair, construction, day labor, and sometimes people who are taking care of others. So your point that we need to make sure that, that we think about who else is covered and the breadth of outreach is really important. So I just I want to underline the importance of your question. Thank you very much, Council Member. Please, thank your you, answer. Thank you, thank you uh, uh, Chair Jean and, and Council Member Lander. We, the Commission absolutely understands the critical role that being um, providing uh, uh, to, to enhance the credibility that we have both in enforcing our law uh, to reaching out to communities, uh, language is hugely important. And it's been a very important priority that um, uh, Chair uh, Malalas has engaged in. So even since uh, she last testified before this committee, I believe at the, um, at the end of uh, uh, March, uh, the number of languages spoken by commi uh, commission employees has increased. So right now we have, um, uh, and this is just one indicator of our diversity, but our staff currently speak 38 languages. Um, up from the last time that the, uh, the commission appeared before this committee. Um, we also, uh, our communications and marketing um, unit as well, is critically aware of this and does an excellent job trying to address uh, the needs of all the New Yorkers and all the languages they speak. As a result, 100% of our media buy-in occurs in, an, in, eth in ethnic uh, media of uh, communities uh, in New York. Um, so those are just but two examples of a lot of, of the work that the Commission has placed into reaching out to New Yorkers in a language that they understand. In addition, a lot of the forms, especially recognizing that legal language and law are sometimes difficult uh, in their terminology and can sometimes um, be difficult to explain to non-lawyers. We've translated documents into, uh, I believe, 10 or 11 languages. I can confirm the exact um, number, so a set of our core documents into those languages to ensure that we reach out to those in a language that they understand and want to communicate in, um, and that we've uh, made uh, efforts to also speak in plain language as well. That's been another priority of the Commission in order to ensure that people are not turned away merely by um, lack of knowledge of perhaps the legal text of our law or uh, the process that uh, occurs in the enforcement uh, function of the agency. Thank you very much, Mr. Stordola. Did I pronounce it correctly? You, you, you did. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> and I just want to, to thank both of you and uh, also Ms. Uh, Zoe Chenich, right? Thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, we're going to continue to work together. I think this is uh, something that uh, we, all of us, should be part of it, the City Council, the Commission, and other entities in New York City, even the employers also, the landlord. All of us, we have to be part of the team because this is not something that uh, we're going to be successful in doing when we work alone, the city council alone cannot do it, the commission alone cannot do it. I think it will take, you know, all of us to work as a team to ensure we get the uh, New York City where the right of people are respected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you. Now let me call the members of the next panel. You will forgive me if I mispronounce uh, your names. <laughs> Karen uh, Kekes, thank you. I was trying to, thank you, Kekes, all right, thank you. Elisa Devins from Nilag. Uh, Salk is easy. I see Salk, but Ni Ni Nicole. Nicole, okay, Nicole Sachs. Thank you. Sarah Sa Brafman. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. You may start any time, please. Can you hear me? Is that good? Hi, thank you so much. I'm Karen Kakeis. I'm the director of the Employment Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Um, our testimony is being handed up there. It is missing a page, so we have emailed it. I'm very sorry about that. Um, I want to uh, thank Chair Eugene for, um, for convening this and um, Council Member Lander and Council Member Williams for sponsoring these, um, these provisions, the Legal Aid Society. Um, it, through our employment law unit represents uh, low-wage workers in the city with all, almost all types of employment claims, many discrimination claims under the city human rights law. We are extremely fortunate to have the city human rights law because as, as um, the, we've already heard, it is intended to be um, the broadest law in the nation and, and that is a wonderful thing for the workers of the city. Um, we are in full support of, um, of 136A, particularly its um, expansion of protections to volunteers, to interns and independent contractors um, and the protections um, that will allow, f that will require franchisors to be liable for any discrimination that's going on in the, in the either retail establishment or the restaurant, whatever it is of the franchisee, we see a lot of that. And that is a, it is, it's very difficult to um, often uh, obtain a remedy for workers who work in a franchisee <coughs> location because the franchisee may not have the assets that the franchisor has, they just may not respond. It, it's, it, to have the franchisor have the responsibility for the discrimination is going to be extremely important and it's perfectly appropriate because as, as, as you said, Council Member Langer, they, they control so much that's going on, how fast your pizza is delivered, what exactly is put on your pizza, they certainly can um, have uh, the ability to control how, uh, how the franchisee employees are acting toward the worker. So we are full support, um, but we don't think that the bill goes far enough and so our concern is that um, although the city law protects many categories that other laws don't, and um, although it's, uh, the remedies are un, uh, uncapped in terms of the emotional distress and punitive damage you, you can get, and although it is, um, it says right in the statute how expansively it's supposed to be interpreted, it does not apply to most small employers. And so this is something that we have talked about several times. There have been bills in the past to eliminate the four employee requirement. Um, and the Legal Aid Society absolutely thinks that should be done, that this is a, a very good first step, but that the next step really is just to take out the four person, four employee requirement. There are 14 states that have already done that. So this is, this is not even an area where New York City would have to be leading. It's, it's something where we really need to catch up with other states. Um, and it is a problem that we see often. There are small doctor's office, small lawyer's office, even small restaurants where it is okay to discriminate against someone based on their sex or their race or their religion or any of the other categories protected by the human rights law. Um, as, long as, as long as it's a small employer, th there is no legal remedy under the city's law. And so that is, is something that we hope um, we can continue to talk about and will be the next step. Um, as for intro 799, we are, we are in full support and, 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 and absolutely um, it should be clear that anybody who requests a reasonable accommodation um, should not be retaliated against because they're making that request and if they are doing so, their employer should be um, liable for a separate claim. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any? Mm -hmm. uh, hi, um, my name is Alyssa. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you um, in support of Intro 136. Um, my name is Alyssa Devins, I'm a senior staff attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Um, we have an employment law project. Um, um, today I'd like to focus on um, the franchisor, franchisee uh, components for the proposed uh, uh, of uh, Intro 136A. Um, we have a lot of cases that involve uh, franchisors and franchisees and it's, it's been really frustrating sometimes. I have a current case against a well-known fast food company. Um, really sympathetic facts. I have this uh, young 17-year-old guy who was looking for a part-time job, a recent cancer survivor, amputee, really up in great physical condition. He went to apply for a position um, and got the job, was told to return. 
came to the office or came to the site and uh, the manager saw his leg and said, you know, I don't, with that you can't work here. Sent him home, we filed a complaint um, at the EUC and uh, the franchisor of course just says, you know, we, we're not liable and the uh, individual franchisee, which is a small um, employer, has just ignored, ignored us completely. And so this great kid um, who's been discriminated against might not have recourse unless he goes through litigation and then we don't know if he tries to go after this small employer who doesn't respond, it'll probably just end up in a default judgment and who knows what will happen. So we're so grateful with this uh, proposed legislation and I think it could be really helpful for um, people like my client. So. Thank you very much. Uh, next one. Okay, I think it's on. Hi, I'm Nicole Salk from Brooklyn Legal <coughs> Services, part of Legal Services NYC from the Workers' Rights and Benefits Unit. Thank you very much to Councilmember Eugene and Councilmember Landra. Thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you for proposing this legislation. Um, it is excellent legislation, <laughs> put, uh, proposed legislation, um, as has already been put out by I think everyone who's testifying today. In particular, uh, we like the, the expansion to make it clear that franchisors um, could be held liable um, if they're just, if, if, you know, anybody in the franchisee um, company is, is discriminating. That's extremely important. Um, they are it, it's an incentive to um, encourage those companies, as you had talked about, uh, Starbucks. It's encourage, it encourages those larger companies to put out, um, you know, training and to and to really discourage any kind of discrimination. It's particularly an issue around sexual harassment. We just recently had, um, just in one of our offices, two uh, separate uh, potential clients coming in complaining about sexual harassment. This is a huge issue, especially in the retail world. Um, I, uh, the other thing that I wanted to just briefly talk about, also just the other expansions to make it clear that family members can be included um, in that four number, uh, which is very important, um, that independent contractors actually and volunteers can be included uh, potentially in that four number, which is really important because potentially that employer could be one person who has you know three other so-called probably misclassified <laughs> independent contractors. Um, and it, the legislation needs to be, it needs to, the law needs to be clear, not just for the commission, but for the law, because this is a law that is enforced sometimes in court. So I think that's really important that this isn't, isn't just an issue for the commission. This is, a, this is an issue potentially for bringing a case in court where the commission, as great, as wonderful as they are, and as expansive as they look at these definitions. The courts don't always do that. So that's why this is really important. And then the commission may not always be as progressive as they are right now. So that's really important for future, uh, for future commissions. Um, I also just really wanted to say quickly that um, it is my understanding that the commission has lost about $1.5 million in their current budget, um, which it makes it harder for them to um, enforce the law and it's not um, relevant specifically to this proposed legislation, but it is relevant to the question that I think that you asked council member uh, Eugene about what can the commission do? It's harder for them if they have less funds and less resources to do their work. But we thank you for all your support that you have given to them um, and also just um, uh, in creating the best, some of the best uh, anti-discrimination uh, law in the country, and also for m most recently um, putting out $2.5 million uh, for um, employment uh, legal services, which is really going to help uh, our community do the work that we need to do to help low wage workers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. My name is good Sarah. Afternoon. <laughs> My name is Sarah Brothman. I'm an attorney with A Better Balance. We are a nonprofit legal advocacy organization that works to ensure that working families don't need to compromise their economic security when they have caregiving responsibilities. And we are here, like 
our colleagues in full support of intro 799 and 136. Uh, the written testimony goes into both 136 and intro 799, but I want to focus more on 799 and um, the anti-retaliation provision. And I just want to paint a picture of, of what that can really look like for someone when they're retaliated against. So we run a free legal hotline where anyone can call us with questions they have around um, workplace discrimination issues. And we received a call from a worker. I'm going to call her Star. She became our client. Um, she was going back to work. She had just had a baby. And um, she, before she went back to work, she said, I'm going to need break time to express milk. So um, like was spoken about by the commission, pregnancy and lactation accommodations are part of the human rights law. And she requested break time. And her supervisor, the day she came back, she found a written document that said, I explicitly do not want to follow this law. Um, and I don't want to give her break time um, to pump. And a few days after she came back from maternity leave, they fired her. So re she requests, makes the accommodation, she, come, she requests the accommodation, she comes back, and then they retaliate by firing her. Um, and this happens to people all the time, right? People call, we specifically hear from a lot of people requesting disability, pregnancy, and lactation accommodations. Um, but this happens. To, to so many people we hear from who request accommodations. And it's not just important to have clarity in the law for, enforcing, for enforcement agencies or for lawyers, but it's important also for workers because before they even need to get to an enforcement agency, they can call us and if we can point them explicitly in the law where they can go and tell an employer, no, you, you can't retaliate against me, then they can resolve problems on their own. They don't necessarily need to come to uh, you know, the Commission on Human Rights or they don't need to necessarily then go to court. They can actually resolve the problem on their own. And when it's in the plain text of the law that we can point them to that, then it makes it a lot easier for them to advocate for themselves. So we really thank you for putting the clarity in the law that not only lawyers and agencies need, but the workers themselves need. Um, and, and I want to thank you for, for doing that, both for um, the retaliation provision and for independent contractors. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. The next uh, speaker from the next panel is that uh, Mr. Jeff Anscombe. From International Franchise Association. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's it. Thank you, Chairman Eugene. Thank you for having me, Councilman Welcome, Lander. Welcome, sir. Mm -hmm. Good to be with you all this afternoon. I appreciate the time. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Jeff Hanscom. I am with the International Franchise Association. We represent the franchise industry, franchisors, franchisees, and a number of groups that provide services to the franchise industry, marketing firms, attorneys, things of that nature. We have some pretty serious concerns with the language in Intro 136A, specifically the franchise language, as, you, as our name would entail. Um, the, we've heard, I've heard, uh, sitting in the audience uh, this afternoon, I've heard a number of references to Starbucks and the relationship that they have with their employees and some of the things that they did last month uh, in relation to the anti-discrimination training and things of that nature. All well and good. The key difference, Starbucks is the employer of all of the baristas and folks who works in every Starbucks around the country. Starbucks is not a franchise. The franchise brands have no employment relationship with the folks who work in the franchisee establishment. There is no employment relationship there. Uh, the employment relationship exists between franchisee employee and franchisee. It does not exist between franchisee employee and franchisor. The franchise brand um, has no say over the hiring practices, the firing practices, the wages, the benefits, things of that nature that the franchisee provides to his or her employees. Also, there is no control exerted by the franchisor over day-to-day -day operations in a franchise. Now, sure, there are definitely 
pro, uh, prescriptions, uh, what, the, what the food looks like, what the decor looks like, um, things of that nature. The point there being, obviously, one of the pillars of franchises, franchising is to ensure a consistent experience from franchise establishment here in New York City to one where I live in Virginia, to Florida, to California, so things of that nature. Obviously, there has to be prescriptions in order to ensure that my, your experience, my experience, or anyone's experience is the same from franchise to franchise. However, franchisor does not exert and does not have any employment relationship with the folks who work in those establishments. Um, each one is are locally owned and operated. Here in New York, or within New York City, I should say, approximately, there are over 9,000 franchise establishments operating across the city employing around 110,000 New Yorkers in one way, shape, or form. And we've heard throughout the morning, or throughout, I should say, the afternoon, it seems to be very focused on one segment of that industry thus far. However, it's important to remember that right here in New York, there are over 700 brands operating in the franchise model. There are brands in pet care, home care, car care, gyms, child care, obviously your hotels, restaurants, 700 different brands, 700 plus different brands operating in just under the International Franchise Association, we have upwards of 1,400 brands operating across 300 plus lines of business, all of which are impacted by the language in 136A. It is a per se determination of liability um, when there is no employment employer relationship between a franchise brand and a franchisee employee. Some of the language that's inserted just uh, just prior to the franchise language, I believe it's section B as opposed to C as the franchise language, goes through a test of employment. You have to direct an, an immediate control or, or some sort of control over the employment conditions of an employee in order to be considered an employer under 136 or the human rights law. And then it goes on to say, but for the franchise industry, it's a per se determination of liability. Why would we, why would we not in, in use the same test that, that is being inserted for all employers? Why single out one segment of the economy um, and dispense with any sort of fact by fact or f uh, case, case by case or fact finding analysis in any employment relationship. Um, we're happy to work with you all on it. We do think that obviously protecting the civil and human rights of every New York employee is, is of paramount importance. Uh, and we think that that should be and liability for any violations thereof would best uh, be served by enforcing them against the responsible party, which in this case would be the ultimate employer. Uh, and in, in our instance is the franchisee. And with that, I'd be happy to have a conversation or take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have some questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Council member Linda, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know we want to move through the hearing, and I won't spend too long as much as I'm, I'm tempted. And obviously, we can follow up. And obviously, we have a different point of view. Um, sure. But your point, you, you're, you're so. We'll just and I was trying to use the Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts example to expl to exactly explore exactly this question: what we would expect from a corporate employer who does in fact uh, employ directly all the employees mm -hmm. and a franchise employer. So, uh, Dunkin' Donuts is looking to have the same level of control over how the latte is presented to their customers that Starbucks is. I assume yes. Uh, I would assume Dunkin' Donuts has the same interest in presenting a consistent experience across any Dunkin' Donuts, yes. But it's okay for them not to care about whether there's a consistent application of the New York City human rights law against discrimination. <laughs> that's, your, that's your legal position here. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't I, mean I, it as a rude, I think it is. I don't, I don't mean it to be obnoxious. Well, like, I think you're saying that they can be held to the same, you know, standards of how to make the latte or how to present the store, but not how to protect the people key, under the New York City human rights law. The key difference in your example, Starbucks has an employment relationship with the folks who work in each Starbucks. But that doesn't make them less able to guarantee that the latte is d presented in, the, in, well, in precisely the way that they want it presented. So why should it prevent them from making sure that the, employ the manager of that store sure. follows the human rights law? Apples and oranges. Starbucks makes a conscious decision to be a corporate entity and have corporate owned stores. Dunkin' Donuts made a conscious decision to go in, into the franchise model. The franchisee is the person who is the employer. Dunkin' but Donuts. I got it, but the employee okay. at the Dunkin' Donuts makes the latte, right? Sure. Okay, yes. and and Dunkin' Donuts is able to exercise a level of control through its franchise agreement that determines how that employee is going to make the latte. Okay. So if they provided a set of trainings for the manager, if they insisted that just like you've got to have a training to make that latte, you've got to have a training to make sure you follow the human rights law, 
why would they be less sure. able to ensure that their franchisees and their employees were complying with the human rights law than they would complying with the guidance on how to make the latte? I'm not sure I'm following your logic. However, uh, simply by providing a best practices manual that it re in talks about how to make a latte, how to treat an employee, how to treat a customer, that in and of itself does not create a per se liability. Of it does create an practices. affirmative defense, though. If you look at 8107 under the human rights law, there is a guidance that when you seek to enforce against an employer, an affirmative defense that the employer can bring is that they, and that's the whole point of covering employers. Starbucks corporate is obviously also not on the ground in each Starbucks here to make sure that every employee follows the New York City human rights law. Mm -hmm. The way the law is written relating to broader corporate and employer liability provides an encouragement for companies to provide a corporate culture and practice and set of policies that complies with the New York City human rights law, and that's what we are looking to have done in the franchises. Sure. We are more than supportive of <laughs> having everybody comply with the New York human rights law. Franchisees are the ultimate the business owners. They operate under the national brand. The national brand is just that. It is a brand. It is not an employer. It has no employment relationship with the folks in that establishment. So if there is an issue, if there is a discrimination issue among employer and employee, the issue is with employee, and it, or employer, and I should say, and in this instance, the employer is the franchisee. What if there was a franchise where there was a case of systemic discrimination, where I won't name one here because I don't want to accuse anybody, but what if there was a franchise where it, it turned out that across the franchise operation, there was a systemic situation of discrimination? So in that instance, that would just what exactly 136A does away with is a case-by-case -case analysis. There is no case-by-case. Well, there's case always a case-by-case -case well, analysis of every act of discrimination. No, it, so The language in 136A does not allow for a case-by-case -case analysis with regard to franchising. It is a per se liability that franchisors are automatically liable for the actions of their franchisees. Okay, I mean, maybe you didn't look at 8107, which then goes through all the ways in which uh, an employer, uh, one of these situations is looked at. That's not only covered in 136A, the existing human rights law speaks to the responsibilities an employer has. I may not be referring to the section correctly, so no, I can look again, while we're talking. I, you know, I won't go on here. The chair is, um, we'll, we'll be glad to have this conversation afterwards. And if, if you think there's a better way to achieve what you hear the goal is, mm -hmm. because the goal of covering them is partly to create a situation of liability. But in my mind, the value of that situation of liability is to give, I don't think people will be able at the level of the individual franchisee, I don't believe they will be able to develop the training practices and materials. Think about how to put together a corporate culture. Think mm -hmm. about how to do employment in the ways that root out discrimination any more than they would be able to make exactly the kinds of products that their franchisors expect them sure. to make without the resources being spent by the franchise company to help them do so. So the goal here is to make sure that franchise companies have just as much incentive to make sure that corporate policies and corporate practices and corporate resources are spent ensuring compliance with the human rights law, just like they do in all these other areas, and just like increasingly corporate employers recognize that they have to do. Mm -hmm. If you've got other thoughts on how we could ensure that happened and uh, adjustments to the legislation or the law that will help us achieve that, we'd be glad to, to look at them. Uh, but that is our goal, and we'd be, if, if you share that broader goal, yes. then perhaps we could find some appropriate ways to address Happy it. Happy to do it. As I mentioned, we as an industry are fully supportive of having New York City human rights and all human rights laws apply as appropriate uh, and protections be as robust as possible and we'd be happy to work with you with you all on it. Uh, again, just reiterating our concern would be with the language in 136A as currently authored, uh, it is unprecedented. There is no law like it anywhere in the country. Which that makes us happy. So well, if that's, that's meant as a counter argument, yeah, then I won't I'm be that effective. We're pointing, thrilled to be unprecedented. Pointing out the facts, someone mentioned in, in testimony previous that uh, New York wouldn't be leading on this. This in, in this instance, this is unprecedented at any city, state, or federal level uh, and offers, again, very serious concerns for us. But with that being said, we are more than happy to work with you on how to achieve the overarching goal, and we think that there are certainly ways to do so. So I appreciate your time. Any thank other you. questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Lander and Mr. Jeffs. I thank you, Ascom. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you for very testimony. much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Let us call the next panel. Please, uh, when I pronounce uh, your name, if I'm very close, if you understand what I'm saying, please <laughs> come, <laughs> because it is very difficult to read the writing of certain people, even though, you know, this is very, 
artistic. Uh, what we call Julian uh, Dawar. I believe this is correct, right? Yes. Oh, very good. We got this right. <laughs> Margaret uh, Mac McIntyre. Thank you very much. Zara Zif, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Jessica Perez. Thank you so very much. You can start, uh, any one of you, please uh, state your name for the record. I'm Julian Darwall. I'm a senior staff attorney at the SIC Coalition, and I'm going to be speaking with respect to intro number 799. Thank you, Chair Eugene and Councilmember Lander, for having me. The SIC Coalition is a nonprofit and nonpartisan national community based organization. And our goal is to work toward a world where Sikhs and other religious minorities in America will be able to practice their faith freely without bias and discrimination. Our legal program addresses issues of bias and discrimination on a daily basis. The Sikh Coalition has worked to secure safer schools, counter hate and discrimination, create equal employment opportunities, and empower the Sikh community. We strongly support the proposed amendment because it would strengthen crucial protections for religious minority groups by prohibiting retaliation by employers and landlords and others against those who ask for reasonable accommodations. As we know from our work, protections against retaliation give teeth to the important legal protections that exist. Sikhism is the world's fifth largest religion and there are more than 25 million Sikhs around the world with over half a million Sikhs in New York. Sikhs have a physical identity that makes them stand out in public, including turbans and five articles of faith, kesh, unshorn hair, ganga, a small comb, kara, a steel bracelet, kirpan, a religious article, and kachara, um, underpants. In order for Sikhs to abide by their sincerely held beliefs, they must maintain the articles of faith and often must secure uniform accommodations from employers. For example, headwear and beards are prohibited by many employers and an accommodation must be negotiated for a Sikh to practice the faith and carry out workplace duties. Employers are often unwilling to provide these religious accommodations and many have taken adverse actions against um, when Sikhs assert their right to an accommodation. Sometimes a retaliatory act is overt, as for example when an employee is fired. In other cases, an employee may be subject to more subtle adverse actions, such as a change in job roles, being singled out for pretextual sanctions, facing segregation in the workplace, or being made the subject of hostile treatment. Therefore, prohibitions on retaliation are fundamental to the proper functioning of rules that require accommodations. We believe that any request for religious accommodation, including an informal verbal request, should fall under the protections provided by the proposed amendment. The Sikh Coalition has served numerous clients in employment disputes involving religious accommodations, often addressing issues of retaliation. In 2004, we represented Mr. Sethari Singh Khalsa, formerly known as Kevin Harrington, a practicing Sikh employee of the MTA. Mr. Singh Khalsa heroically served New Yorkers during 9-11 when he carefully reversed a train away from Lower Manhattan, saving lives. In the aftermath of 9-11, the MTA sought to remove him from his post because he wore a turban. Mr. Singh Khalsa wished to continue operating trains while wearing his turban, which would require uniform accommodation, but the MTA planned to relegate him to a lesser position in the train yard if he did not give up his request. Without intervention by the Sikh Coalition, the MTA would have demoted a heroic veteran train operator, an adverse act taken in response to his desire for a uniform accommodation. The proposed protection for, employer, for employees is crucial for people like Mr. Singh Khalsa because it prevents employers from adding insult to injury. They cannot be allowed to enforce discriminatory denials of religious accommodations with additional wrongful actions. During the same period, the Sikh Coalition successfully represented Frank Mahoney Burroughs, a practicing Sikh and senior sales associate with AutoZone, after he was mistreated and then terminated after a religious accommodation request. Mr. Burroughs adopted the Sikh faith and asked to wear his turban at work. His manager threatened to grab and throw him out of the store and later forced him to either take his turban off or go home. 
Mr. Burroughs also suffered verbal humiliation by both colleagues and customers after his request for an accommodation. And without the proposed amendment, employees like Mr. Burroughs would be unprotected under the human rights law from retaliatory actions such as those taken by AutoZone in response to the request. In 2015, the Sick Coalition represented a practicing sick mail carrier who was told by Disney World that because his turban and beard had to be hidden from guests that he would be relegated to a single mail route. Our client requested to continue his regular mail routes where he could be seen by customers with his religiously mandated turban and beard. In negotiating a settlement, the Sick Coalition was able to convince Disney not only that they should accept this accommodation, but also that any adverse action taken in response would be subject to the protections against retaliation applying under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Employees who seek to assert their rights under the human rights law deserve the same protections against retaliation as those asserting rights under federal law. Forcing a person to choose between their religion and their profession deprives them of their right to free religious exercise. And as we have seen too often, retaliation is a common step by some that some employers take in response to requests for religious accommodations. Retaliation can range from overt actions like termination to more subtle ones. And in order for the accommodation rights provided under the human rights law to have their desired effect, they must be prepared with corresponding protections against retaliation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Next speaker, please. Thank you, Chair Eugene and Council Member Lander. My name is Margaret McIntyre. I'm chair of the Legislative Committee of NELA New York, which is the New York affiliate of the National Employment Lawyers Association. Um, uh, NELA New York has about 350 members across the state, mostly in New York City, and we are on the front lines of uh, working to uh, enforce this great law that we have here. And Neela New York deeply appreciates the willingness of the City Council to continue to seek to improve the city human rights law and to ensure that it is effectively enforced. Um, I'm just going to speak in favor of both int intro 136A and also 799. I'll start with 136A. Uh, we support uh, this bill in its entirety um, and um, think that um, it will serve to make it clear who is responsible and who is not. Um, the, one of the pro common problems is when an employer has four employees and one gets fired and they're down to three, <laughs> are they off the hook? <laughs> and this bill will stop that little loophole. Um, I also think that, um, that Section 3, which makes, um, makes clear that the law pr protects directors, officers, members, and partners is, is extremely important in terms of, um, you know, getting at this, um, this concept that we want to stop discrimination in New York City, um, not just figure out um, ways that some people are protected and some people aren't. Um, again, and it's extremely important that um, volunteers, interns, and independent contractors are covered. Um, I think it's it important that um, in terms of covering the uh, uh, um, just want to say something about this uh, franchise situation. I mean, we see again and again that uh, franchisors do exercise a lot of control over the workplace. Um, it seems t to be kind of a lot of um, very, very strict requirements. And um, I think that The, the point that is important about this is that um, what matters is that the, the person or entity that has control, whether it's in the form of um, being involved in the workplace or whether it's, it's, it, 
it is involved in um, um, setting all of the rules and regulations that the franchisee much must control, must abide by. That's what matters, is who, who has control over it, who can stop this. And um, I think that this bill as it is does make it um, clear that having one particular model for you know the corporate structure of, of uh, an, an agency or a workplace is, is should not be um, a way of evading responsibility for the law. Uh, and then in, with respect to intro 799, um, I can tell you this is from personal experience. This is a very important loophole being closed. Uh, I had a client who uh, went to the EEOC on his own to complain about disability discrimination, and it never even occurred to him to check the retaliation box. And then when we had to go to court, and I s and I added retaliation under state and city law, even though he hadn't he hadn't checked it at the EEOC. The uh, lawyer for the employer said, oh, no, that's not covered. We're requesting a reasonable accommodation is not uh, protected activity under state and city law. And I looked it up, and yeah, it, it's, that's the case. And um, the, our testimony mentions these cases. And so Neela in New York um, feels very strongly that 799 closes an important loophole. And we urge the council to pass both of these laws. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please, if there is any. <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank Hello. you so much for the opportunity to. Oh, is this? Is that better? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Ziff, and I am uh, a model and a founder and executive director of the Model Alliance. Uh, too often, models are treated as objects and not as legitimate members of the workforce who deserve to be treated with the same dignity and respect as anyone else who works for a living. Um, as a model who started working at the age of 14, I've had a good career. Uh, that said, my peers and I have experienced inappropriate demands, including uh, routinely being put on the spot to pose nude and provide sexual favors. In some cases, models are being treated more like escorts with their agencies sending them to known predators and putting them in compromising situations that no child, no person should have to deal with. Uh, essentially, all working models operate under fixed term exclusive contracts to their modeling agencies who exert a great deal of control over their working lives. The agencies then contract with a client, whether that's uh, a fashion brand or a publishing company uh, for the model's work. Because the primary purpose and activity of modeling agencies is to obtain employment for their models, they should be treated as employment agencies under the law, which would subject them to necessary uh, licensing and regulation. Instead, though, these agencies call themselves management companies, creating a huge loophole through which they evade this closer look by the government. Uh, further, modeling agencies in New York argue that models are independent contractors. Uh, and although the New York City law protects independent contractors against sexual harassment, because of the multi-level structure of hiring in the modeling industry between the model, her agency, and the client, we're concerned that the city law generally does not apply to models either. Um, so when a company directly hires an independent contractor, the company can be sued for violating the New York City human rights law. However, when a client contracts with a modeling agency to hire a model, and the modeling agency sends the model to the client, uh, we're worried that the multi-level structure of contracting is gonna bar the model from bring, bringing a claim. And um, Council Member Land Lander, thank you very much for introducing this important bill. Um, I understand that it, it would make explicit that all persons who perform work for an employer, including independent contractors, whether they're paid or unpaid, are considered employees. Um, and I wonder what, uh, what does perform work for an employer mean or include um, you know, models don't typically work for their agencies. Uh, rather, they're working for the client. And so does that still count? That's really my main question here. Um, I guess I'm supposed to be testifying, not asking you questions. <laughs> but um, uh, essentially, the modeling industry really deserves a closer look from the New York City Council. And the perceived glamour of the industry and gaps in the law should no longer be used to deny models a safe workplace or appropriate recourse if abuse occurs. 
um, we really deserve no less than uh, any other segment of New York City's workforce. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Hello, can you hear me? There. Um, hi, my name is Jessica Perez. I have worked also as a model in the fashion industry for more than 15 years. The fashion industry operates as if though regulation or just common decency doesn't exist in this country. You would be hard pressed to find a model who hasn't experienced some form of harassment or discrimination while at work. The reason for this is that every fashion industry professional who is represented by an agency is considered a freelancer in the eyes of the law. I can say with confidence that the majority of us have been the victims of highly inappropriate comments, discrimination, threats, and coercion into actions that were against our own wishes. To give you an example, when I was 18 years old, I was hired for a magazine shoot and told my agent to let the client know I did not shoot nudes or clothes that were transparent. I got to the set and was instantly pressured by the stylist and everyone around her to agree to shoot a transparent top without a bra underneath. I was told if I didn't do it, I would get nowhere in my career. I said no. The stylist barely looked at me as she threw clothes at me to put on. As soon as I got on the set, she came up behind me, ripped off my skirt and underwear, and left me standing there with nothing on the bottom. There, she said to me, you said you didn't want to shoot a sheer top. That's what you get. I could literally be here all day telling you stories like these that I've either experienced or have heard secondhand. These stories have happened while other adults were in the same room with us, all too afraid to stand up and speak out for the same reason we didn't do so. We were afraid of the consequences. We were afraid to lose our jobs, afraid to lose our income. We were afraid to put our livelihood at risk. The she will never work again in this town talk that is often used in TVs and movies for comedic relief is very much a real threat for a freelancer in the fashion industry. Models, makeup artists, hairstylists, photographers are constantly threatened to be blacklisted by clients for a wide array of what should be illegal reasons. There is nothing in place right now to stop these abusers from taking place, and in the meantime, these abusers are laughing at you. They know that freelancers don't have any protections and they are acting accordingly. I implore you to not let them continue laughing at you at our expense. The cost has already been too high. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. And to all of you, all four of you, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very brief. <laughs> please, uh, one minute. Thank you. Very brief. Council um, Member Alenda. Miss? Yeah, thanks to all of you. And I thank just you. want to thank uh, Ms. Perez and Ms. Ziff, especially for being here and for the work you've done with us, both to help make sure we try it through the Freelancers and Free Act to make things a little better, to prevent models from getting stiffed. And I'd be interested after this hearing if you know how that is going and whether people have been able to avail themselves of that law. Um, and I'd also be happy to sit down together. Maybe we could do it with Assemblywoman Razek, who I know you've been working with at the state level. Um, obviously, protections we could provide at the state level could be even broader and stronger. Uh, and if that will happen, wonderful. But if not, if there are other things that we can look at in the city law um, around the exclusive contracts or around some of these other provisions, we'd be, we'd be happy to do so. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you Councilmember Linda. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank, thank you. you. The next panel is uh, Kathleen, Kathleen Pierce. All right, thank you very much. Nina Irvin. All right, thank you. Carolina Salas. Thank you. Julian Richardson. Erin Bigwell. Thank you very much. Yes. 
Hello? Okay. <laughs> you can start, and uh, please uh, remember to state your name for the record. Absolutely. Um, I'm Caitlin Pierce, the Executive Director of Freelancers Union. Um, good afternoon. And um, on behalf of the 150,000 uh, New York City freelancers that we represent, we want to thank the committee for having this hearing. Uh, thank you, Chair Eugene, for chairing. and. Um, especially thank Council Member Brad Lander for his continued leadership as being a champion for the freelance workforce. Um, so freelancers are a huge and important part of the fabric of New York City, uh, living and working in every single borough. Nationally, we represent 36% of the workforce and contribute over $1.4 trillion to the economy every year. Um, unfortunately, despite our growing numbers, freelancers continue to face harassment and discrimination in the workplace. Uh, as we've heard today, with very few protections or paths for recourse. Um, the simple truth is that too many freelancers must go to work feeling unsafe. They rarely have a supervisor or HR department where they can safely report violations, rarely have coworkers they can confide in, or an adequate safety net that would allow them to pursue recourse from clients who threaten to retaliate. Even employers with progressive and inclusive policies for their employees rarely to never include any protections or considerations for their freelance contractors. Um, generally, independent workers are facing these issues alone, and for many, bringing attention to acts of harassment or discrimination will mean losing the client. Not surprisingly, uh, freelancers' union's research shows that 75% of incidents that freelancers are experiencing go unreported, and I think that's a pretty conservative estimate. Um, I would like to thank the freelancers union members who are here today. Um, they represent countless freelancers who have had to endure abuse or walk away, um, often at great professional and personal cost. Um, I did want to share the experience uh, briefly of one member, uh, Angela Ivana, a makeup artist um, from Astoria, Queens, who submitted testimony uh, but could not be here today because she needed to work. So from Angela. As the only African-American female beauty professional, I was held to different standards than everyone else in the agency. I was told I could not have a photograph on the agency website because my agents did not want his clients to see that I was black. On one occasion, he told me that a photographer I was booked to work with was also African-American and that I should get along with other black people and make friends on this job and to keep a smile on my face so they don't think I'm a black expletive that I won't repeat here. This discrimination meant that I was excluded from larger paying jobs and campaigns. I was put in a position where I was reliant on pleasing the person discriminating against me to ensure that I could feed, clothe, and house myself. My health and well-being began deteriorating. When I decided to leave the agency, I lost all of my contacts and had to rebuild my entire career. I had to exhaust my savings to survive, and now I'm still struggling to find work today, a year and a half later. With no repercussions, my agent abused and harassed over 20 professionals on his roster. As contractors, we didn't know who to report his behavior to, since we were all freelancers and depended on the income of a person who facilitated our work, people were hesitant to speak up. Living in New York is expensive, and there's a constant threat of being able, unable to survive here. Last year, the New York City Council led by example and was the first in the nation to pass the Freelance Isn't Free Act, um, which really recognized the challenges that freelancers are facing in this new economy. Um, we all know that more work needs to be done. Independent workers must have a clear path to report workplace issues and equal protection from retaliation. Um, and just to reiterate the argument that's made by many, it, it is so important to clearly state in the law and clarify this law so that freelancers are protected, not just for the workers themselves, but also to really show um, clients and hiring parties. Um, so many of them who really believe that if they're hiring um, a worker as a freelancer, then they can do whatever they want because that worker will have no rights and no backing from the city. And, and this is not true and we need to make that statement. Um, on behalf of Freelancers Union, I urge council members to pass this bill 
And to clarify, human rights law protects millions more of the city's working people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Sorry, I'm a little challenged when it comes to microphones. <coughs> um, I'm going to be testifying on, <laughs> sorry, <coughs> I'm going to be testifying <coughs> on sexual assault in the workplace. <coughs> and um, I had wonderful folks at Freelancers Union help me edit down my testimony. Uh, but for the purposes of giving you my full, or at least the most of my story, so you can make an informed decision, I was able to get it to like five and a half, five minutes and 30 seconds. May I have five minutes and 30 seconds? Get closer? Okay. Okay. We would love to hear mm -hmm. your story, what you're going to share with us, and we are very, very concerned about <laughs> it. But for the sake of time, and also other people want to testify, please <coughs> try to shorten it a little bit. Got okay. it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. But again, we are very concerned about your case. Thank very. You. That the reason why this uh, hearing is uh, taking place. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carolina Salas. Thank you for the opportunity <coughs> to speak with you today. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to, to look at you as I speak. I am a freelance marketing expert working in the financial district of Manhattan. But back then in 2002, I was in college and working in Midtown at Papi John and Bistro and Bar on 22 East 54th Street and Madison Avenue. As a restaurant hostess, um, at first I was an employee, but then was asked by Tom and Burke at Papi John and Bistro and Bar and one of his business partners, Conrad Gallagher, an award-winning chef from Ireland, to help out for two weeks with the launch of a new venture in Boston. They stopped paying me as an employee and converted me to a freelancer for this project. I believe it was with specific purpose of reducing my rights and covering their tracks because of what would happen on this trip. After the first long day of work in Boston, we gathered at the local restaurant and bar took over the day's work. Mr. Gallagher placed the order and grabbed two drinks for Mr. Burke for himself and gave me a fruit punch. Since I was under 21 and not of legal drinking age, I would have never imagined that the fruit punch was highly alcoholic. I drank some of the punch and soon after my eyesight became blurry and I experienced difficulty walking. Despite feeling sluggish, tired, and out of sorts, I made it to my hotel room and was shocked and confused <coughs> to find Mr. Gallagher there. I was fading quickly and recall passing out as I was questioning what he was doing in my room. I don't know how much time had passed, but I woke up next to find Mr. Gallagher completely naked and on top of me. I passed out again and woke up the next morning. I quickly gathered my stuff, including my luggage, as I prepared to head out the door. Mr. Gallagher awoke and asked me if I was going to tell anyone about what happened. And I said, no, but this cannot happen again. He insisted on speaking some more, but I couldn't because I was feeling extremely unsafe. At that moment, I felt the only safe option I had was to leave the hotel room. I was then 19, 20 years of age, and Mr. Gallagher, my boss on the project, was 31, 32. By not addressing the sexual assault, I ensured I wouldn't fall apart emotionally, and I was concerned with keeping my job. I couldn't afford to lose it. But I'm not just here because of what Mr. Gallagher did to me. I'm also here because of what Mr. Burke, my former boss, and Mr. Gallagher's business partner did to me. Mr. Burke is the owner of the following four restaurants here in New York City. Papillon Bistro and Bar on 54th Street and Madison Avenue, Oscar Wilde, New York City on 27th Street and 6th Avenue, Lily's Times Square on 49th Street and 8th Avenue, Lily's Union Square on 17th Street and 5th Avenue. Within 24 hours of being sexually assaulted by Mr. Gallagher, Mr. Burke attempted to sexually assault me. After a very long second day of work, Mr. Burke handed me what looked like a glass of water and tasted like water. But upon drinking some of it, I began to feel very dizzy and then we were in started spinning. Given the intensity of my drowsiness, dizziness, slurred speech, and loss of vision, I felt vulnerable, confused, and concerned for my safety. I then told Mr. Burke that I wasn't feeling well and needed to safely get back to my new hotel room. Mr. Burke kept insisting that he go up to my hotel room with me. I kept pushing his advances away, but he wouldn't take no for an answer. I quickly rushed to my hotel room and away from him. At that time, I didn't know what was happening to me, but years later, I came to know with certainty that Mr. Burke had drugged the water he handed me with what I believe is GHB ketamine mixture due to the symptoms I experienced, a common date rate drug. Within a minute of placing the latch on the door, I stumbled over to the bed and suddenly blacked out. I laid unconscious for 12 hours before beginning to realize <laughs> that my body was completely paralyzed. Not knowing why I had blacked out, I, suspe I suspected that Mr. Burke had not just given me water, but all I can think about at the moment 
was that I was already several hours late to work. I didn't want to lose my job as it was my only source of income. And I didn't have relatives to turn to for financial help. Even though Mr. Gallagher sexually assaulted me and Mr. Burke drugged and attempted to sexually assault me, I did not know where to turn, how to report what happened to me without risking my job. I concluded that my best option was to keep my distance from these two men. I didn't feel safe to work with them, but I was forced to finish out the two weeks in Boston in order to get paid for the job I was already committed to. In retrospect, I suspect that Mr. Burke and Mr. Gallagher were trying to cover their tracks by paying me in cash as a freelancer and not as an employee. I had nowhere to turn or anyone to talk with about how to handle the unexpected sexual assaults by my two bosses without them retaliating against me. Being transitioned in an, into an independent worker isolated me even further, and I felt like I lost any protection I would be afforded as an employee. If the bill passes, I will have clear rights and protections I didn't feel like I had before. And as a freelancer, I would have an avenue to pursue justice with clear legal and financial protections and without fear of retaliation. Freelancers should no longer be ignored, dismissed, discarded, and disrespected. I urge you to please take into consideration that my experience with sexual violence in the workplace is not, a, is not unique and it actually happens regularly. By passing this bill, you will ensure that freelancers and independent workers know they are afforded the opportunity to stand up for themselves. Thank you very much for considering my testimony. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for your courage. I want to thank you for your courage. Thank you so much. And I know that you thank speak you. on behalf of so many. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Next one. Can you hear? Okay. Hello, my name is Nina Arizari. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I live in Astoria and Queens and work in arts and fashion, balancing a full-time position at a luxury boutique and freelancing as a performer, writer, and creative director. My journey as a freelancer began when I was 17, working as a performance artist and singing professionally in an all-female salsa band. The sexual harassment from my band's senior manager started after about a year, at a point when I had grown to trust this person. There was a clear power dynamic at play when he made his initial advance at me, though I had tried to brush it off as something that did not happen or could not happen and ignored the remarks. He would take me on different outings, require me to get all dressed up to meet music industry professionals and gatekeepers, including a record label executive. He was often bringing wine with him on those outings for both of us to drink even though I was only 18. I feel like the goal, I feel like the goal now was to get me drunk so I would make unethical decisions. Eventually the advances became more aggressive into things like groping. It was not only him making advances but it was the other managers too. One had remark that the two other managers were attracted to me as well, and this was considered normal conversation. The whole situation became unbearable for me to handle and a constant pressure. I wanted to have my own agency. I wanted to feel safe. I did not want to be harassed. I wanted to have control over my own voice and image. I became fed up with the situation, and I end up leaving the band altogether, stepping away from a great professional opportunity to avoid the constant harassment on the cusp of getting a record deal during a um, television deal. During the time, I wish there was an HR type of department to make a complaint to or there was some code of ethics and freelance work that all parties would agree to follow. As a freelancer, it feels like you don't have the same respect and rights at work. Thank you for hearing my testimony and considering this bill. It would positively impact the industries I have worked in and help prevent the harassment that I and so many others experience. Thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Uh, thank you for considering this update to city human rights law. My name is Jillian Richardson, and I'm a freelance writer from East Williamsburg in Brooklyn. Recently, I was typing on my laptop at a co-working space when a fellow freelancer approached me. I was worried you weren't going to come in today, he said. I couldn't find you. You should be sitting by the window. The window is where the pretty people should sit. Uh, I didn't say anything, but he kept going as he gestured to my body. That guy who's sitting at the table right now is fine, but he's no you. I want to be looking at you. After he left, I sent the owner of the space an email. I said that I was being harassed and wanted the man to be told that his actions were not acceptable. A few minutes later, the owner of the space approached me. 
Don't worry about it, he said. He does that to everybody. The owner never said that he was sorry for the incident and, to my knowledge, never did anything to address the situation. I sat there for the rest of the day furious and had no idea what else I could do except never return to the space. Later, I went onto the co-working space's website and discovered that the company had no official, had no official sexual harassment policy or anything resembling an HR department. The community aspect of co-working spaces is often similar to an office, at least when it comes to physical proximity to other people. But these spaces are also without the rules and guidelines that seek to ensure respectful and safe office etiquette. No space, to our knowledge, requires sexual harassment training of all of its members. Many co-working spaces are small franchises. The companies, owners, and operators of these spaces need to be responsible for their own behavior and for addressing concerns about harassment that are brought to them. And in this era of increasing independent work, freelancers need to know that the law clearly protects them. My experience changed the way that I think about workplace harassment. It's frustrating to know that I may get catcalled on my way to work only to walk into a co-working space that makes me feel just as unprotected. Passing this bill to amend the city human rights law would send a clear message to freelancers like me that our rights are protected just as those of any employee and it would hold more companies responsible for providing workplaces free from harassment and discrimination. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, on behalf of the community. And I want to thank uh, each one and all of you for your testimony. And, oh, I'm sorry, one more. Thank you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Erin Bagwell. I truly appreciate the opportunity to share my story with you today. Um, I'm a filmmaker from Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I produced and directed Dream Girl, which is a documentary about inspiring and ambitious female entrepreneurs. To fund the film, I raised $100,000 in 30 days on Kickstarter and was named, and we premiered at Obama's White House in 2016. I was asked to be part of Oprah's Super Soul 100, which is a group of 100 influencers making social impact on their industries. However, before I set out to create Dream Girl, I was working at an advertising company in Midtown as a print freelancer, and I was being sexually harassed. When the CEO would walk by, the women in my department would pull their chairs in, hoping to avoid his unwanted touching. The VP of the company told my colleague he wished he got in early enough to look up her skirt when she plugged in our digital signage every morning. And my boss told me that he almost broke his neck looking at me one day while I was walking to my desk. I think that comment did it. I stopped wearing skirts and dresses to work. I stopped wearing any clothing I deemed flattering. I stopped speaking up in meetings. And I stopped trying to contribute to the growth and success of my team. I stopped mentally showing up for work. Feeling like I had no voice in the workplace and no clear way to protect myself from harassment as a non-employee, I quit in January of 2014 and I've worked my, for myself for the past four years. However, three months ago I got pregnant and my husband and I decided I should take on more freelance work in order to create more financial stability for our family. And I found myself back on the job boards looking for freelance work, but honestly, I'm afraid to go back. I want to know this time I'll have legal indisputable rights against the discrimination I might face. And I want to know that I will be able to bring all my talents, experience, and ambition to work without the fear of being taken advantage of. And more than anything, I want to know that this time I'll be protected I urge you all on the committee today to believe in my future and the future of these very brave women who have spoken their stories as freelancers of New York and vote yes on Bill 136A. Thank you very much and thank you to each one and all of you for your courage and for sharing your story with us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, could you please uh, wait for one minute? I think Councilmember Lender has a uh, Something to say? Thank you. I Thank just you. want to add my thanks to all of you for uh, having the courage to show up here today and to let you know I think the idea here is both to say as freelancers and independent workers, we see you as full employees and professional workers that your work is valued regardless of your tax status. Um, and of course, the whole idea of the human rights law is that regardless of your gender, you're fully equal and you're entitled to full rights in the workplace and everywhere else. So. 
thank you for helping remind us of why we're doing this uh, and for having the courage to testify uh, today. It makes a big difference in our ability to push forward with our colleagues toward passing this law. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you again uh, to all of you and thank you to the members of the committee. Thank you, Councilmember Brad. The meeting is adjourned.